A client is diagnosed with Bell's palsy. The nurse assessing the client expects to note which symptom? 1. A symmetrical smile. 2. Difficulty closing the eyelid on the affected side. 3. Narrowing of the palpable fissure on the affected side. 4. Paroxysms of excruciating pain in the lips and cheek on the affected side. Answer 2. Difficulty closing the eyelid on the affected side rationale. The facial drooping associated with Bell's palsy makes it difficult for the client to close the eyelid on the affected side. A widening of the palpable fissure, the opening between the eyelids and an asymmetrical smile are seen with Bell's palsy. Paroxysms of excruciating pain are characteristic of trigeminal neuralgia. The nurse working in the emergency department ed is assessing a client who recently returned from Nigeria and presented complaining of a fever at home, fatigue, muscle pain, and abdominal pain. Which action should the nurse take next? 1. Check the client's temperature. 2. Isolate the client in a private room. 3. Check a complete set of vital signs. 4. Contact the primary health care provider. Answer 2. Isolate the client in a private room. Rationale. The nurse should suspect the potential for Ebola virus disease, EBD, because of the client's recent travel to Nigeria. The nurse needs to consider the symptoms that the client is reporting, and clients who meet the exposure criteria should be isolated in a private room before other treatment measures are taken. Exposure criteria include a fever reported at home or in the end of 38.0 degrees Celsius, 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or headache, fatigue, weakness, muscle pain, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, or signs of bleeding. This client is reporting a fever and is showing other signs of EBD and therefore should be isolated. After isolating the client, it would be acceptable to then collect further data and notify the primary health care provider and other state and local authorities of the client's signs and symptoms. A client is admitted with suspected diabetic ketoacidosis DKA. Which clinical manifestations best support a diagnosis of DKA? 1. Blood glucose 500 mg per deciliter, 27.8 mmol, L, arterial blood gas is pH 7.30, PACO 250, HCO3 to 26. 2. Blood glucose 400 mg per deciliter, 22.2 mmol, L, arterial blood gas is pH 7.3, PACO 240, HCO3 to 22. 3. Blood glucose 450 mg per deciliter, 25.0 mmol, L, arterial blood gas is pH 7.48, PACO 239, HCO 3 to 29. 4. Blood glucose 350 mg per deciliter, 19.4 mmol, L, arterial blood gas is pH 7.28, PACO 230, HCO 3 to 14. Answer 4. Blood glucose 350 mg per deciliter, 19.4 mmol, L, arterial blood gases, pH 7.28, PACO 230, HCO 3 to 14. Rationale. DKA is caused by a profound deficiency of insulin and is characterized by hyperglycemia. Blood glucose level greater than or equal to 250 mg per deciliter, 13.9 mmol, L, ketosis, ketones in urine or serum, metabolic acidosis and dehydration. The correct option is 4, as it represents an elevated blood glucose in the arterial blood gases, ABGs indicate metabolic acidosis. Option 1 is incorrect, as the ABGs indicate respiratory acidosis. Option 2 is incorrect, as the ABG values are within normal, and option 3 is incorrect, as the ABGs indicate metabolic alkalosis.
The nurse is developing a plan of care for a client at risk for acute respiratory distress syndrome ARDS. As part of the plan, the nurse will assess for which sign or symptom for early detection of this disorder. 1. Edema 2. Dyspnea 3. Frothy sputum 4. Diminished breath sounds. Answer 2. Dyspnea rationale. In most cases of ARDS, tachypnea and dyspnea are the first clinical manifestations. Blood-tinged frothy sputum would be a later sign after the development of pulmonary edema. Breath sounds in the early stages of ARDS usually are clear. Edema is not directly associated with ARDS. A caloric test is prescribed for a client suspected of having disease of the labyrinth. The nurse should obtain which essential item in preparation for this test? 1. An otoscope 2. A tongue blade 3. An emesis face and 4. An ophthalmoscope. Answer 1. An otoscope rationale. A caloric test is contraindicated if the client has a perforated tympanic membrane. Air may be used as a substitute or if the client has an acute disease of the labyrinth. An otoscopic examination should be performed before the caloric test to rule out perforation and to determine whether the ear canal contains cerumen, which must be removed before the test. An ophthalmoscope, a tongue blade, and an emesis basin are not essential items. A client has just been admitted to the nursing unit following thyroidectomy. Which assessment is the priority for this client? 1. Hypoglycemia 2. Level of hoarseness 3. Respiratory distress 4. Edema at the surgical site. Answer 3. Respiratory distress rationale. Thyroidectomy is the removal of the thyroid gland, which is located in the anterior neck. It is very important to monitor airway status, as any swelling to the surgical site could cause respiratory distress. Although all of the options are important for the nurse to monitor, the priority nursing action is to monitor the airway. A client with myasthenia gravis is having difficulty with airway clearance and difficulty with maintaining an effective breathing pattern. The nurse should keep which most important items available at the client's bedside? 1. Oxygen and meter dose inhaler 2. Ambu bag and suction equipment 3. Pulse oximeter and cardiac monitor 4. Incentive spirometer and cock pillow. Answer 2. Ambu bag and suction equipment rationale. The client with myasthenia gravis may experience episodes of respiratory distress if excessively fatigued or with development of myasthenic or cholinergic crisis. For this reason, an ambu bag, intubation tray, and suction equipment should be available at the bedside. The nurse has provided instructions to a client with a diagnosis of myasthenia gravis about home care measures. Which client statement indicates the need for further teaching? 1. I will rest each afternoon after my walk. 2. I should cough and deep breathe many times during the day. 3. I can change the time of my medication on the mornings when I feel strong. 4. If I get abdominal cramps and diarrhea, I should call my health care provider. Answer 3. I can change the time of my medication on the mornings when I feel strong. Rationale. The client with myasthenia gravis and the family should be taught information about the disease and its treatment. They should be aware of the sign adverse effects of anticholinesterase medications and corticosteroids and should be taught that timing of anticholinesterase medication is critical. It is important to instruct the client to administer the medication on time to maintain a chemical balance at the neuromuscular junction. If it is not given on time, the client may become too weak to even swallow.
resting after a walk, coughing and debreathing many times during the day, and calling the primary health care provider when experiencing abdominal cramps and diarrhea indicate a correct understanding of home care instructions to maintain health with this neurological degenerative disease. The nurse is giving a client with a left leg cast crutch walking instructions using the three-point gait. The client is allowed touchdown of the affected leg. The nurse should tell the client to perform which action? 1. Advance the crutches along with both legs simultaneously. 2. Advance the crutches along with the right leg and then advance the left leg. 3. Advance the crutches along with the left leg and then advance the right leg. 4. Advance the left leg along with right crutch and then the right leg and left crutch. Answer 3. Advance the crutches along with the left leg and then advance the right leg. Rationale. A three-point gait requires good balance and arm strength. The crutches are advanced with the affected leg and then the unaffected leg is moved forward. Option 1 describes a swing through gait. Option 2 describes a three-point gait used for a right leg problem. Option 4 describes a two-point gait. The nurse is assisting a primary health care provider, PHCP, with the insertion of a Miller-Abbott tube. The nurse understands that the procedure places the client at risk for aspiration and should therefore implement which action to decrease this risk. 1. Insert the tube with the balloon inflated. 2. Place the client in a semi-fowlers to high-fowlers position. 3. Instruct the client to cough when the tube reaches the nasal pharynx. 4. Instruct the client to perform a Valsalva maneuver if the impulse to gag and vomit occurs. Answer 2. Place the client in a semi-fowlers to high-fowlers position. Rationale, the miller rabbit tube is a nasoenteric tube that is used to decompress the intestine. As in correcting a bowel obstruction, initial insertion of the tube is in PHCP responsibility. The tube is inserted with the balloon deflated in a manner similar to the proper procedure for inserting a nasogastric tube. The client is usually given water to drink to facilitate passage of the tube through the nasopharynx and esophagus. A semi-fowlers to high-fowlers position decreases the risk of aspiration if vomiting occurs. A balsalva maneuver is not helpful and is not used if the impulse to gag occurs. A client is brought to the emergency department by Emergency Medical Services EMS, after being hit by a car. The name of the client is unknown and the client has sustained a severe head injury and multiple fractures and is unconscious. An emergency craniotomy is required regarding informed consent for the surgical procedure. Which is the best action? 1. Obtain a court order for the surgical procedure. 2. Ask the EMS team to sign the informed consent. 3. Transport the victim to the operating room for surgery. 4. Call the police to identify the client and locate the family. Answer 3. Transport the victim to the operating room for surgery. Rationale. In general, there are two situations in which informed consent of an adult client is not needed. One is when an emergency is present and delaying treatment for the purpose of obtaining informed consent would result in injury or death to the client. The second is when the client waives the right to give informed consent. Option one will delay emergency treatment and option two is inappropriate. Although option the fourth of may be pursued, it is not the best action because it delays necessary emergency treatment. A client is being evaluated as a potential kidney donor for a family member. The client asks the nurse why separate teams are evaluating the donor and recipient. What is the most appropriate response by the nurse? 1. Helps reduce the cost of the preoperative workup. 2. Saves the client and the recipient valuable preoperative time. 3. 
avoids a conflict of interest between the team evaluating the recipient and the team evaluating the donor for. Provides for a sufficient number of persons reviewing the case so that no information is overlooked. Answer 3. Avoids a conflict of interest between the team evaluating the recipient and the team evaluating the donor rationale. Both the kidney donor and the kidney recipient need thorough medical and psychological evaluation before transplant surgery. Separate teams evaluate the donor and the recipient to avoid a conflict of interest in providing care for the two clients. Options 1, 2, and 4 are not related to the purpose of this approach. The nurse in the healthcare clinic is providing instructions to a client regarding the use of a hearing aid. Which statement is most appropriate for the nurse to include? 1. The hearing aid should not be worn if an ear infection is present. 2. The ear mold for the hearing aid should be washed with mild soap and water once a month. 3. The hearing aid should be removed from the ear at the end of the day and then turned off after removal. 4. The hearing aid contains a lifelong battery, so you will not need to be concerned about changing batteries. Answer 1. The hearing aid should not be worn if an ear infection is present. Rationale, the client should be instructed that the hearing aid should not be worn if an ear infection is present. The client should wash the ear mold frequently with mild soap and water and use a pipe cleaner to clean the cannula of the hearing aid. The client should be instructed to turn off the hearing aid before removing it from the ear to prevent any squealing feedback. The hearing aid should be turned off when not in use, and the client should keep extra batteries on hand at all times. The client has an impairment of cranial nerve too. Specific to this impairment, what should the nurse plan to do to ensure client safety? 1. Speak loudly to the client. 2. Test the temperature of the shower water. 3. Check the temperature of the food on the dietary tray. 4. Provide a clear path for ambulation without obstacles. Answer 4. Provide a clear path for ambulation without obstacles. Rationale, cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve which governs vision. The nurse can provide safety for the visually impaired client by clearing the path of obstacles when ambulating. Speaking loudly may help overcome a deficit of cranial nerve 8, vestibulocochlear. Testing the shower water temperature would be useful if there was an impairment of peripheral nerves. Cranial nerve 7 facial in its glossopharyngeal control taste from the anterior two-thirds and posterior third of the tongue, respectively. The nurse provides home care instructions to a client diagnosed with impetigo. Which statement by the client indicates the need for further instruction? 1. I need to continue with the antibiotics as prescribed. 2. I need to wash my hands thoroughly and frequently throughout the day. 3. I should wash my dishes separately from those of other household members. 4. It is not necessary to separate my linens and towels from those of other household members. Answer 4. It is not necessary to separate my linens and towels from those of other household members. Rationale. The client needs to separate his or her linens and towels from those of other household members. Thorough hand washing, separating linens and towels, and separate washing of the client's dishes are required because the infection is contagious so long as skin lesions are present. Antibiotics are administered and should be continued as prescribed. Ultraviolet UV light therapy is prescribed as a component of the treatment plan for a client with psoriasis and the nurse provides instructions to the client regarding the treatment. Which statement by the client indicates a need for further instruction? 1. Treatments are limited to 2 or 3 times a week. 2. 
The UV light treatments are given on consecutive days. 3. Eye goggles need to be worn to prevent exposure to UV light. 4. Just the area requiring treatment should be exposed to the UV light. Answer 2. The UV light treatments are given on consecutive days. Rationale. UV light treatments are limited to two or three times a week and are not given on consecutive days. Safety precautions are required during UV light therapy. It is best to expose only those areas requiring treatment to the UV light. Protective wrap around goggles prevent exposure of the eyes to UV light. The face should be shielded with a loosely applied pillowcase if it is unaffected. Direct contact with the light bulbs of the treatment unit should be avoided to prevent burning of the skin. A client with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome AIDS is receiving gancyclovir. The nurse should take which priority action in caring for this client? 1. Monitor for signs of hyperglycemia. 2. Administer the medication without food. 3. Administer the medication with an antacid. 4. Ensure that the client uses an electric razor for shaving. Answer 4. Ensure that the client uses an electric razor for shaving. Rationale. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is a viral disease caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV which destroys T-cells, thereby increasing susceptibility to infection and malignancy. Because of gancyclovir causes neutropenia and thrombocytopenia as the most frequent side effects. The nurse monitors for signs and symptoms of bleeding and implements the same precautions as for a client receiving anticoagulant therapy. The medication may cause hypoglycemia, but not hyperglycemia. The medication does not have to be taken on an empty stomach or without food and should not be taken with an antacid. The nurse has instructed the family of a client with stroke brain attack who has homonymous hemianopsia about measures to help the client overcome the deficit. Which statement suggests that the family understands the measures to use when caring for the client? One. We need to discourage him from wearing eyeglasses. 2. We need to place objects in his impaired field of vision. 3. We need to approach him from the impaired field of vision. 4. We need to remind him to turn his head to scan the lost visual field. Answer 4. We need to remind him to turn his head to scan the lost visual field. Rationale. Hmm. Homonymous hemianopsia is a loss of half of the visual field. The client with homonymous hemianopsia should have objects placed in the intact field of vision and the nurse also should approach the client from the intact side. The nurse instructs the client to scan the environment to overcome the visual deficit and this client teaching from with the intact field of vision. The nurse encourages the use of personal eyeglasses if they are available. A client is admitted to the emergency department with an open fracture of the right tibia. What intervention is most appropriate for this client? 1. Remove the client's shoes. 2. Place the client in a semi-fowler's position. 3. Check the neurovascular status of the area distal to the extremity. 4. Apply a tourniquet above the area of bleeding and loosen it every 15 minutes. Answer 3. Check the neurovascular status of the area distal to the extremity. Rationale. To prevent further damage, the neurovascular status must be assessed for temperature, color, sensation, movement, and capillary refill. Tourniquets are not used to control hemorrhage in extremities because of the risk of tissue ischemia. Direct pressure is applied at the site and over the proximal artery nearest the fracture if bleeding occurs. Clients need to be kept in a supine position to help prevent hypotension and shock. Shoes are not removed because this action may cause increased trauma. 
A client arriving at the emergency department has experienced frostbite to the right hand. Which finding would a nurse note on assessment of the client's hand? 1. A pink edematous hand 2. Fiery red skin with edema in the nail bed 3. Black fingertips surrounded by an erythematous rash 4. A white color to the skin, which is insensitive to touch. Answer 4. A white color to the skin, which is insensitive to touch rationale. Assessment findings in frostbite include a white or blue color. The skin will be hard, cold, and insensitive to touch. As thawing occurs, flushing of the skin, the development of blisters or bleps or tissue edema appears. Options 1, 2, and 3 are incorrect. A client had a transphenoidal resection of the pituitary gland. The nurse notes drainage on the nasal dressing. Suspecting cerebrospinal fluid CSF leakage, the nurse should look for drainage that is of which characteristic. 1. Cerosanguineous only 2. Bloody with very small clots 3. Sanguineous only with no clot formation 4. Cerosanguineous. Surrounded by clear to straw colored fluid. Answer 4. Cerosanguineous. Surrounded by clear to straw colored fluid rationale. CSF leakage after cranial surgery may be detected by noting drainage that is serosanguineous from the surgery and surrounded by an area of clear straw-colored drainage. The typical appearance of CSF drainage is that of a halo. The nurse also would further verify actual CSF drainage by testing the drainage for glucose, which would be positive. An adult client was burned in an explosion. The burn initially affected the client's entire face, anterior half of the head, and the upper half of the anterior torso. And there were circumferential burns to the lower half of both arms. The client's clothes caught on fire and the client ran, causing subsequent burn injuries to the posterior surface of the head and the upper half of the posterior torso. Using the rule of nines, what would be the extent of the burn injury? 1. 18% 2. 24% 3. 36% 4. 48%. Answer 3. 36% rationale. According to the rule of nines with the initial burn, the anterior half of the head equals 4.5%. The upper half of the anterior torso equals 9% and the lower half of both arms equals 9%. The subsequent burn included the posterior half of the head equaling 4.5% and the upper half of the posterior torso equaling 9%. This totals 36%. The nurse is caring for a client admitted to the hospital with a suspected diagnosis of acute appendicitis. Which laboratory result should the nurse expect to note if the client does have appendicitis? 1. Leukopenia with a shift to the left 2. Leukocytosis with a shift to the left 3. Leukopenia with a shift to the right 4. Leukocytosis with a shift to the right. Answer 2. Leukocytosis with a shift to the left rationale. Laboratory findings do not establish the diagnosis of appendicitis. But there is often an elevation of the white blood cell count. Leukocytosis with a shift to the left in increased number of immature white blood cells. Options 1, 3, and 4 are incorrect because they are not associated findings in acute appendicitis. A client complains of calf tenderness and thrombophlebitis is suspected. The nurse should next assess the client for which finding? Bilateral edema 2, increased calf circumference 3, diminished distal peripheral pulses 4, coolness and pallor of the affected limb. Answer 2. Increased calf circumference rationale. The client with thrombophlebitis, also known as deep vein thrombosis, exhibit redness or warmth of the affected leg tenderness at the site. 
possibly dilated veins, if superficial, low-grade fever, edema distal to the obstruction, and increased calf circumference in the affected extremity. Peripheral pulses are unchanged from baseline because this is a venous, not an arterial, problem. Often thrombophlebitis develops silently, that is, the client does not present with any signs and symptoms unless pulmonary embolism occurs as a complication. A client with laryngeal cancer has undergone laryngectomy and is now receiving external radiation therapy to the head and neck. The nurse should monitor the client for which side and adverse effects of external radiation. Select all that apply. 1. Cystitis 2. Stomatitis 3. Dysgeusia 4. Leukopenia 5. Xerostomia 6. Thrombocytopenia. Answer 2. Stomatitis 3. Dysgeusia 5. Xerostomia rationale. Stomatitis. Inflammation of the mucus lining in the mouth. Dysgeusia. Distorted sense of taste. And xerostomia, dry mouth, are local effects of external radiation to the head and neck. Options 4 and 6 are systemic effects and would most likely occur if radiation were applied to areas around the bone marrow. Option 1 is unrelated to the client's condition. A client with silicosis is being monitored yearly at the healthcare clinic. On assessment, the nurse should ask the client about which manifestations of the disorder. Select all that apply. 1. Fatigue 2. Malaise 3. Anorexia 4. Weight gain 5. Dyspnea at rest. Answer 1. Fatigue 2. Malaise 3. Anorexia rationale. Silicosis is a chronic lung fibrosis that results from the long-term inhalation of silica dust. It is characterized by nodule formation between alveoli leading to fibrosis, malaise, extreme fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, and dyspnea on exertion, not at rest, would occur in a client with silicosis. Additional manifestations include reduced lung volume and upper lobe fibrosis. A client who is intubated and receiving mechanical ventilation is at risk for infection. The nurse should include which measures in the care of this client. Select all that apply. 1. Monitor the client's temperature. 2. Use sterile technique when suctioning. 3. Use the closed system method of suctioning. 4. Monitor sputum characteristics and amounts. 5. Drain water from the ventilator tubing into the humidifier bottle. Answer 1. Monitor the client's temperature. 2. Use sterile technique when suctioning. 3. Use the closed system method of suctioning. 4. Monitor sputum characteristics and amounts. Rationale. Monitoring temperature and sputum production is indicated in the care of the client. A closed system method of suctioning and sterile technique decreases the risk of infection associated with suctioning. Water in the ventilator tubing should be emptied, not drained back into the humidifier bottle. This puts the client at risk of acquiring infection, especially pseudomonas. The home health nurse is planning to teach a client with osteoporosis about home modifications to reduce the risk of falls. Which recommendations would be necessary to include in the teaching plan? Select all that apply. 1. Use night lights. 2. Remove scatter rugs. 3. Use staircase railings. 4. Remove wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. 5. Place handrails in the bathroom. Answer 1. Use night lights. 2. Remove scatter rugs. 3. Use staircase railings. 5. Place handrails in the bathroom. Rationale. Home modifications to reduce the risk for falls include using railings on all staircases, providing ample lighting, removing scatter rugs, and placing handrails in the bathroom.
Removing wall to wall carpeting is not necessary as long as it is in good condition. The client with a cervical spine injury has cervical tongs applied in the emergency department. What should the nurse include when planning care for this client? Select all that apply. 1. Using a roto rest bed. 2. Ensuring that weights hang freely. 3. Removing the weights to reposition the client. 4. Assessing the integrity of the weights and pulleys. 5. Comparing the amount of prescribed traction with the amount in use. Answer 1. Using a roto rest bed 2. Ensuring that weights hang freely 4. Assessing the integrity of the weights and pulleys 5. Comparing the amount of prescribed traction with the amount in use rationale. Cervical tongs are applied after drilling holes in the client's skull under local anesthesia. Weights are attached to the tongs which exert pulling pressure on the longitudinal axis of the cervical spine. Serial X-rays of the cervical spine are taken, with weights being added gradually until the X-ray reveals that the vertebral column is realigned. After that, weights may be reduced gradually to a point that maintains alignment. The client with cervical tongs is placed on a striker frame or roto rest bed. The nurse ensures that weights hang freely and the amount of weight matches the current prescription. The nurse also inspects the integrity and position of the ropes and pulleys. The nurse does not remove the weights to administer care. A client with liver dysfunction has low serum levels of fibrinogen and a prolonged prothrombin chime PT. Based on these findings, which actions should the nurse plan to promote client safety? Select all that apply. 1. Monitor serum potassium levels. 2. Weigh client daily and monitor trends. 3. Monitor for symptoms of fluid retention. 4. Provide the client with a soft toothbrush. 5. Instruct the client to use an electric razor. 6. Monitor all secretions for frank or occult blood. Answer 4. Provide the client with a soft toothbrush. 5. Instruct the client to use an electric razor. 6. Monitor all secretions for frank or occult blood. Rationale. Fibrinogen is produced by the liver and is necessary for normal clotting. A client who has insufficient levels is at risk for bleeding. The PT is prolonged when one or more of the clotting factors 2, V, 7, or X is deficient, so the client's risk for bleeding is also increased. A soft toothbrush and electric razor and monitoring secretions for evidence of bleeding are measures that provide for client safety.